We're gearing up for an active evening in parts of South Texas. Already some thunderstorms on the radar screen. Of course, we'll take a close look at those and also let you know what to expect the rest of the night and the next few days. See you in a few minutes. A six year old shot and killed as she sat in her car seat. A 23 year old under arrest in this random shooting that the chief called tragic. Next. A new report on homelessness in San Antonio in Bear County revealed today what the numbers show coming up. Spring is tick season. If you're planning to spend time in the great outdoors, coming up will tell you how best to protect yourself and what repellents work the best. And why a recent cyber attack may cost you more the next time you fill up at the gas pump. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, an atrocity. That's how San Antonio Police Chief William McManus describes the murder of a six-year-old girl. This is the suspect, Andrew Ray Elizondo. He's now in police custody. The victim, Soraya Perez, shot and killed during a car club meetup on the west side last night. Our Garrett Berger is at police headquarters where Chief McManus just provided details on this Capital arrest. Garrett's been following this story all day. Garrett, you certainly have, you know, your heart goes out to this family. What do we know about the suspect? Well, right now, there's not a whole lot. The chief just briefing media just a few minutes ago in the past hour about the arrest of 23 year old Andrew Ray Elizondo, who the chief says is an acquaintance of six year old Soraya Perez's mother. Now, Elizondo is still being interviewed as we speak, so the chief did not have many details on what led up to the actual shooting or what caused it, who Elizondo was believed to be shooting at. But video from the car club meetup that's been posted online does give us a clearer picture, at least on how it unfolded. Now, this video that you're seeing on your screen now shows the tiny head of six-year-old Soraya Perez poking above the rear window of that red sedan she's riding in as it tries to leave the parking lot. The video online shows that the car, as it sits in the lot, a man can be seen punching the driver's side. And as it leaves, finally leaves the lot, three men can be seen chasing after it and yelling as the car speeds off down Commerce. But then a few seconds later, another video records gunshots as the car drives away. It's not clear from the video where the shots came from or who the shooter is, but we know who at least one of those rounds hit. A young girl, uh, not even starting her life yet, um, was 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 killed in a senseless act. And there, again, there's I, I don't even know I don't have words to even describe the feeling that that uh, that that gives me or anybody in law enforcement for that matter. Soraya Perez was hit in the upper torso, the chief tells us, and the car pulled into a nearby convenience store parking lot. And though Perez was rushed to University Hospital, the young girl died of her wounds. Now, Elizondo is facing a charge of capital murder. As we said, the chief, the chief tells us he is being questioned right now. We're hoping to learn some more details about exactly how this unfolded. But the chief did say this is not a domestic violence incident. He also made clear to draw a distinction between the kind of car club meetup that was happening last night and the kind of car car takeovers that police have been trying to crack down on. He made clear that this was not one of those takeovers that police have been that police have been trying to battle over the past few months. We'll have more details for you on the arrest coming up at six. Live at Public Safety Headquarters, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Meantime, the search continues for a suspect who shot a man at an apartment complex on the southeast, rather south, uh, southeast military last night. San Antonio police say it happened at the Sereno Park Apartments in the 3900 block of Southeast Military. An 18 year old man says that he was shot when he opened his door. He saw someone standing there with a the gun. The gunman fired the victim hit in the chest and taken to the hospital. Police are still looking for the gunman. We're gearing up for an active evening here in parts of South Texas when it comes to thunderstorms. We have a severe thunderstorm watch in effect for a good portion of our viewing area, but that's basically Kendall County, 
Bear County here, including San Antonio, of course, Atascosa, Atascosa County points westward to the Rio Grande. That's where we have the primary risk for severe thunderstorms through about 10 or 11 p.m. So far, we've had one severe thunderstorm pop up this afternoon that started in Edwards County, moved through Real County and is now moving into Bandera County, but has weakened and is now not considered a severe thunderstorm, just remnant good soaking rain as that pushes to the southeast. So here's the primary aspects I want you to expect here and prepare for this evening. For the Rio Grande and the Hill Country, severe storms are likely scattered in nature through about 10 p.m. Here in San Antonio, a lot of those storms will be headed our way, but they should start weakening as they approach us. Nonetheless, we still have the risk for some severe weather arriving later on tonight. But east of I-35, the storm should really fall apart and you're not going to get as much rain. We'll talk about the primary threats and even more rain ahead in our forecast and how much we could get and where coming up in a few minutes. Steve. Thank you, Adam. It is a snapshot of the city's homeless population. That new data giving the city, county and local organizations a deeper look at the city's homeless community. And this year, the point in time count, as it's called, well, the results are a bit different. Tiffany Huertas has a look at what impacted the count and those results. The results of the point in time count always drive our planning efforts over the next year. The point in time count report is an annual census of sheltered and unsheltered people experiencing homelessness during a single night in January. The report released today was different than previous years. Due to safety concerns brought on by the pandemic, the South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless, or SARA, canceled their count of unsheltered individuals. We did a one night shelter count and so we presented those results today. But for our unsheltered count, we looked at data over the past year. Katie Vela, the executive director of Sarah, says one of the trends they saw was an increase in the number of people reporting a mental health concern who are unsheltered. This is going to be a key part of our strategy moving forward into this next year. 71% of people who are unsheltered reported a mental health concern. Another key finding, the total count of people experiencing homelessness in shelters on the night of the count was 1,499, a 10% decrease from the 2020 sheltered count. Vela says there's two possible reasons why. Due to the moratorium on evictions, and we think it might also be due to concerns about being in a congregate setting because of COVID-19. So we're expecting that when the moratorium on evictions ends, we'll start to see more people seeking shelter. The data collected from this report helps local agencies determine the types of programs that are needed. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. This week, a pretty busy week in Washington as President Biden enters a crucial time frame for his legislative agenda. But the path to get things done between the White House and Congress, not so easy. Isabel Rosales is in Washington with the push toward bipartisanship. President Joe Biden pitching his infrastructure plan as a way to get more Americans back to work. To make sure working people of this country get to share in the benefits of a ra of rising economy. On the table, a more than $2 trillion proposal. But Republicans say Biden's plan is just too big. If we can find something that actually spends money on infrastructure, mm -hmm. roads and bridges, imagine that, as opposed to what the Biden plan does, which is spends a trillion dollars on things which have no relationship to infrastructure, we can cut a deal. Republicans offered a counterproposal, limiting the size of the plan and slashing the costs. The proper price tag for what most of us think of as infrastructure is about six to eight hundred billion dollars. To find middle ground, the president is meeting with West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, a moderate Democrat who says he will not vote with his party unless Republicans are involved in the process. Why can't we try to make this work? In order to work toward a compromise, President Biden will host his first White House meeting with leaders from both parties and both houses of Congress on Wednesday. The next day, he'll meet just with GOP senators. We're open to talk about mm -hmm. infrastructure and how to pay for it. The White House hoping for progress by Memorial Day, but progressives want to move forward as soon as possible. If Republicans want to come on board seriously, great. If not, we're going to do it alone. In Washington, I'm Isabel Rosales. We have some breaking news on the COVID vaccine front. The FDA actually authorizing Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for ages 12 to 15. 
The Food and Drug Administration said Monday the shot is safe and offers strong protection for younger teenagers based on testing of more than 2,000 U.S. volunteers. And taking a look at the daily COVID-19 numbers in Bear County, Metro Health reporting 108 new infections and one new death tonight. There are 206 COVID positive patients hospitalized, 69 are in the intensive care unit, 30 are on ventilators. The European Union could be on the verge of welcoming American travelers, but there are things you need before your next visit and in order to be allowed back into the U.S. Myra Arthur with what one expert says you should consider before booking your flights. More than a year after it halted all non-essential travel to contain the coronavirus, the EU could soon welcome back some tourists just in time for summer. Countries like Croatia, Greece uh, are already open, and if you're vaccinated, you don't need to do any pre-testing. A proposal released a week ago would restrict entry to people from countries with low COVID-19 infection rates. A key part of that plan is something called a digital green certificate, which travelers to Europe would carry to prove they've been vaccinated or are immune to the virus. It looks like June should be a go for Spain and France. I think the big question now is the UK. We haven't heard when the UK will open, but it's looking good. If you're planning to travel to Europe, one expert says keep these three things in mind. Number one, do your research. Each individual member nation will decide when and how to relax border restrictions. Check to make sure you meet the requirements as the rules are still being amended. Number two, get vaccinated because when it comes to cruises, you must be vaccinated uh, to go on any of the cruises. Um, that are currently available this summer. And three, you'll need a negative COVID-19 test to fly back to the U.S. That's regardless of whether you've been vaccinated. Myra Arthur, KSAT 12 News. Based on current CDC travel rules, all travelers ages two and older flying to the U.S. from abroad must show a negative viral COVID-19 test result taken within 72 hours of departure before being allowed to board their flights. As Myra just said, travel this summer right around the corner. And if you're doing it by the road, you need to know that about the same time you hit the road, the U.S. could potentially see another big price hike on gas. This as the Colonial Pipeline, the nation's largest pipeline, experienced a ransomware attack on Friday. The system transports nearly half of all the fuel on the East Coast. Three days after the attack, much of the system is still offline. AAA says if the shutdown persists, prices could increase. Right now, the national average is about $3 a gallon. Thus far, Colonial has told us that it has not suffered damage and can be brought back online relatively quickly, but that safety is a priority. President Joe Biden says the Department of Energy is working on getting the pipelines back up and running as quickly and safely as possible. As we said, summer coming up. That might mean Ugh. camping and hiking and more time outdoors and more time with this little bugger. Hotter weather means Texas tick populations is at its peak. How to protect yourself still ahead. As we spend more time outdoors, mosquitoes aren't the only nuisances you need to be aware of. Tick populations are increasing all across the country. 12 on your side's Marilyn Morris on how to best protect yourself from the bugs and the diseases that they can carry. Warm weather in the great outdoors, perfect for camping, hiking, and ticks. Ticks can be found from coast to coast, and the number of tick-borne diseases like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Lyme disease in particular have been on the rise in recent years, so it's really important to take proper precautions. Deer ticks, Lone Star ticks, brown dog, and American dog ticks are the most common in Texas and all can spread disease. Your best defense is a good offense. Yes, it's hot out, but if you're in a grassy or wooded area, long pants are best. 
It's also a good idea to wear light colors so that it's easier to see any ticks that may be crawling on you. Insect repellent should be applied to any exposed skin as well as to the outside of your clothing. Consumer Reports found that repellents containing 15 to 30 percent DEET work best. But if you want to avoid DEET, they also recommend some with 30 percent oil of lemon eucalyptus or 20 percent picaridin. Two they recommend as best buys, Total Home Woodland Scent Insect Repellent and 3M Ultrathon Insect Repellent. Showering can wash away any ticks that may be on your skin but not yet attached attached, and it's an opportunity to check your skin for any bites. If you're bitten by a tick, don't panic. Carefully remove it with tweezers. The sooner you can remove them, the less likely they are to spread disease. Also, many ticks like to attach to dogs, so don't forget to protect your pets as well. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All good advice, but as we look outside with live cam, whoa. Look at that picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know a lot of that is actually blow off cloud cover from thunderstorm okay. in Mexico right now. So it looks pretty dark and gray and ominous, but it's really just the high clouds blowing in from the storms of Mexico. Something we're going to be to be watching all night though. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about a little bit earlier in the newscast. The greatest severe potential is basically between Highway 281 and the Rio Grande, but of course that's a generalized area. Let's start off with the primary threats as we go through this evening into the early nighttime hours. Hail, that's the highest threat. We've got it in the very high category. We could be looking at more golf ball size hail or larger in parts of South Texas, especially west of I-35 and west of 281. Wind gusts, that's our next primary threat. We've got it in the high category. Could see some gusts between 60 and 80 miles per hour. Tornado and flooding on the low end, there's that slight chance, but not the likelihood of seeing a tornado or even flooding. It's mainly hail and strong gusty winds that we're on the lookout for with the storms that develop. One storm already Real County dissipated as it moves into Bandera County. Just a little bit of lightning left over. Otherwise, that's falling apart, but we are expecting more development as we go through the evening. Let's talk about it here. It's going to be developing west of San Antonio and then moving eastward. This model shows at 10 p.m. more of a complex that moves through I-35 generally near and south of San Antonio. So there are some indications that some of these may come together as well and then move through. So it's not going to be hitting everybody at any given time. I'm thinking just about 40 percent of South Texas actually getting storms at any given hour or any time, basically up through 10 p.m. Then they dissipate as they move east of town closer to the Gulf Coastline. Tomorrow, more activity, not all day long, not continuous, but notice noon, some spotty showers on the radar likely. Then we get into the afternoon, a few thunderstorms here and there, mainly just more good soaking rain for the next couple of days. I like the type of weather pattern that I see because the severe potential even Tuesday at 10 p.m. here showing a lot of rain south of town, but the severe potential is much lower and on the low end. So tomorrow and Wednesday, still good rain chances, likely widespread in nature at times, but mainly just good soaking rain. Then we get into the weekend and a few pop up thunderstorms. All right, how much rain and where? Of course, a big question in and around San Antonio. It all depends on the downpours, but we could see between one and two inches in parts of Bear County. The real bullseye here is most likely going to be south of San Antonio, especially along I-35. We're talking Catula, Los Angeles, Fowlerton area. That's even Pearsall. We could see over two inches of rain if everything verifies with what we're seeing. And that's, that's actually the most drought stricken part of our KSAT 12 viewing area. So that would be nice to see. I actually know uh, a few folks with cattle down there just south of Los Angeles near Fowlerton, and they are in desperate need of this rainfall. So this would be good for them. There's actually a cold front dropping in right now, and that's what's really instigating these showers and storms, especially what we had in Real County. Notice Kerrville, Rock Springs, 72. That's yeah, the cold front there. You got temperatures in the 50s to near 60 on the cooler side of that front. That's going to continue to drop southward. So we may be 87 now in San Antonio, but that temperature is quickly going to drop and we'll be down closer to 70 at 10 p.m. with some of those scattered showers and thunderstorms, especially between the Rio Grande and 281. And yes, we do have a risk of some hail here in San Antonio, but that risk increases significantly the farther west you are of San Antonio. Tomorrow, a few rumbles of thunder, especially the second half of the day, but I think we're mainly just looking at some 
Moderate to even heavy rain showers setting up periodically, intermittently, Tuesday, intermittently, Wednesday. And notice those temperatures, mid 70s for a high tomorrow. And then, yes, upper 60s. You're reading that properly on Wednesday before temps rebound in the end of the week. Wow, what a difference. Thank you, Adam. All right, Spurs heading towards the playoffs, we hope, but it's not on a high note. No, it's not. And the final five are going to be rough because yeah. against all playoff bound teams. When we come back here, we'll get you ready for tonight's game starting off at home against Milwaukee. And Tim Duncan gets a call to the hall this Saturday coming up. The Spurs final five of the regular season have arrived with the Milwaukee Bucks up first tonight at the AT&T Center. It's one of the Spurs final three games at home with just two left on the road and work to be done if they want to stay in contention for the play-in tournament. They're losing three out of four on their latest road trip. The Spurs are still in 10, but now only a game and a half up on the New Orleans Pelicans who won last night against the Hornets, 112 to 110 in 11th. The Spurs will find it tough to finish out with every team left on the schedule, having something to play for that includes back-to-back -back games against the Phoenix Suns who are fighting Utah for the top spot in the West. Now with the last week of the regular season arriving, does it feel like he got there fast in this COVID compressed schedule? I don't make excuses though. You know, a lot of people might say COVID and this, this and that. Uh, you know, I'm a professional, so you know, whatever comes with being a professional, I deal with it. So, uh, you know, yeah, I think it was fast. Obviously 72 games and you know, more back to backs and you know, obviously missing games due to COVID uh, when they first happened after Charlotte and uh, we had to make up some games. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, we got to figure it out and just keep pushing and, you know, try to get wins to, you know, make that play in and hopefully get to the playoffs. All right, tip time tonight, 7.30. Highs for tonight on the night beat. The week has finally arrived. This Saturday, Tim Duncan will be inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. Ceremony is conducted at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Connecticut. Class of 2020, that also includes the late Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett, delayed a year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Duncan, who retired from the game after 19 years with the same team, the same coach with five NBA championships to show for it, was asked recently, where does he find his competitiveness that produced the best power forward in the game? Combination of uh, um, a, a competitiveness uh, on my own part, um, a love for just for playing the game, just love playing, um, hating losing, <laughs> that's a big one. Uh, you don't get, I don't think it, it gets enough credit. Um, and uh, uh, an organization kind of committed to, to putting the best things in place to give uh, uh, a city, a team, uh, a player like myself an opportunity to, um, uh, to win year in and year out. Great times. What the Spurs are putting together for the fans to experience his enshrinement with a photo walk. We've got details of that coming for you up at the night beat. Great. Great to hear from Tom, Tim Duncan. It too. sure is. Sure yeah. is. Thanks, Greg. We'll be back with some breaking news after this. All right, before we go, we got some breaking news on the northeast side. A crash involving a school bus and another vehicle. This is on Ritterman Road. It's near Gibbs Spall Road. We're working to get some more details. Uh, we need to figure out which district this bus belongs to, whether anyone was hurt. We will bring you some new information as soon as it comes in. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5 with us. World News is up next. We'll see you right back here at 6.